bit of a crazy story. There's a, a few different names you've probably seen speaking in chapel today. The first one you might have seen, is, his name is Nasser, and uh, there was a miscommunication uh, with confirming chapel, uh, and so he's actually in North Africa, and I learned that a few weeks ago. He was going to be in North Africa this week, and so he wasn't going to be able to come. So I had asked a friend to come and fill in, and he said, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And I got a call uh, earlier this morning saying, actually, my wife is having a baby, and I'm heading to the hospital. And so uh, me, uh, in my own strength, kind of freaking out a little bit, I'm heading back to my office, and I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to talk about today? And um, through the windows of the cafeteria, I see uh, Dr. Del Gray talk, meeting with a couple of uh, ministry students. And I thought, you know, God prompted my mind. Why don't you go and ask them? And so I did. And I said, hey, would any of three of you be willing to share in chapel in about 30 minutes? And uh, I had a taker. And Shandon is really excited to come, and probably a little nervous too, because this is a, an inch tough crowd. You guys, talking to your peers is a tough thing. But Shandon had the courage to say, yes, I feel like there's something God laid on my heart to share with the, the school, uh, with my peers, with, with Tabor. And so uh, I've asked Shandon to come and share with us today. Now, Shandon is a senior. He is, uh, he's a major in, in Bible and psychology. Um, and he's, he's from liberal Kansas, and he's an RA this year. And so would you please help me welcome and give your attention to Shandon Clausen as he comes to share God's word today. All right, guys. So Ryan kind of stole most of my opening, which was just to earn some sympathy about why I'm up here. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, you guys are a tough crowd. I know that um, there are chapels that you really love and there are chapels that you really don't. And giving me 20 minutes to figure out how to present one that you guys would love is, is a little bit of a difficult task. Um, but a few weeks ago, um, I, so I'm in this class. It's called uh, Life and Writings of C.S. Lewis. And for this class, instead of a formal, which is one of the big papers that the Bible majors write, um, we had to pick certain readings from C.S. Lewis of our choice um, and read them and write a paper and then just present them to the class. Um, so a few weeks ago, I chose one of C.S. Lewis's books called The Problem of Pain. And The Problem of Pain is a book that talks about um, just how can a good God exist in a world that's where there's so much suffering? How can a good God um, possibly have created all of this? Um, and this book just really, really hit me hard. Um, and this book just really touched my heart. And as I was um, sitting up way too late writing this paper, I kept thinking, man, I wish that there was an opportunity for someone to present this to the whole school. I wish that somebody would talk about this kind of thing in chapel. Um, and then, uh, this morning, Ryan came in during our practicum meeting and says, hey, here's this opportunity. And I sat there and I said, no way, nope, nope, not going to do it. And uh, Dell left to go prepare his own thing, and um, I just felt God really pushing me, like, you wanted this opportunity, um, so here it is. So I am here, I'm going to read my paper, but I understand that papers get technical, they get boring, um, so I'm just going to try to recap in my own words kind of what Lewis was saying about pain and how we can deal with that, so... Um, if you would just pray with me really quick, that would just calm my nerves and hopefully open, open a good atmosphere. So, God, I just come to you today, and I ask you um, just for your words today. God, you presented this opportunity um, before me, before the school, and I just pray that these are your words that come out, that I am not the speaker, that you are God, um, that what is said um, just speaks to the hearts of the people here as it spoke to my heart. God, we trust you, um, we look to your presence, and we just thank you for be always being with us. It's in your name I pray. Okay, so I'm going to, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm just going to start reading, and as I feel God prompting me, then I'm going to stop and kind of break down um, what Lewis was talking about. So, Lewis begins the problem of pain with logical arguments for the necessity of the problem of pain in the world. In his introductory chapter, he explains two problems that arise when considering pain. The first is where the book gets its title. 
every person recognizes that the world is filled with pain. It's very obvious that this world is evil and corrupt, and we all know that. This poses a problem to the existence and creates a longing for purpose behind the suffering. So why, why do we have suffering? Why do we have pain? The second issue is how humans could have conceived of a good and loving creator in the midst of an antagonizing world. So Lewis started out as an atheist, um, and one of the big things that he um, talked about in his atheism and his conversion to Christianity was how can people, if, if God doesn't exist, how could people create this concept of a good God? How could we even imagine a good creator if everything is just evil? It doesn't make sense unless he already existed. And so this is how he starts the book. The first two chapters following the introduction of the book explore philosophical elements of God rather than pain. So Lewis tries to talk about a couple things that we know about God or we have to know about God in order to understand pain. The first is omnipotence. So that's kind of a big churchy word that we use about God. Uh, omnipotence means um, all-powerful. So in church, we tend to assume that God can do anything. That means nothing is impossible for God. But Lewis says that there are things that are impossible for God. Um, he says that intrinsically impossible is different than extrinsically impossible. So you can't have two universes that, um, that butt heads that contradict. So um, like an Im immovable object meets an unstoppable force. It can't exist because that's two different universes colliding. So there are things that are impossible for God. And so he kind of explores what those are. And then the next chapter he talks about God's goodness. Um, how can God be good? And he says, his first argument addresses the concern that a good God could not destine us for suffering. However, God is held to a higher moral standard than we can comprehend, meaning this fact does not disprove his goodness. His second assertion is that love is not happiness, which entitles a loving God to impress difficult situations upon those that he loves in the effort of making them something better than entirely happy beings. So basically what that means is that um, love is not giving us everything that we want. Love is not um, just making us completely happy beings because what makes one person happy will hurt another person. You know, if I'm the richest person in the world, that means there have to be more poor people in the world. And so by allowing the possibility of pain, God is saying, um, I love you. Uh, he, he doesn't choose pain for us, but he, he opens it up just to say that I love you. And we can't comprehend this fully because God is held to a different standard than we are. He's, he's held so much higher. His, his mind is just so much bigger than we can possibly comprehend. And so that's why we can't understand. Um, Lewis continues, and he talks about human wickedness. So he, he tries to convince the reader, we are evil. Um, that's something that in America, we are especially don't quite understand that we are evil people. And so Lewis just argues that um, for the point that we are not good. He begins the chapter by noting that Christianity has the difficult task of preaching not only to cure the evil, um, but to diagnose it itself. So way back in ancient times, people knew that we were evil. Um, and so what Christians had to do was just convince each other that God was the solution, that Jesus was the solution. But now we have the dis difficult task of saying we are evil. We have to get people to understand that they are evil before they can understand that they can be redeemed, and that makes it difficult. So our perception of extremes in this kind of sense versus cruel and our belief that vices are natural are the root causes, says Lewis. He continues the chapter by laying out several considerations that should be made when discussing human wickedness. The first is that we tend to look outside ourselves when observing evil. So in other words, we compare ourselves to others without realizing how hypocritical our comparisons are. We look at the other person and say, I'm not that evil, so I can't possibly be an evil person. The second is that we view ourselves as collectively guilty rather than individually. So speeding, for example, we look around and say, well, everyone speeds, so it can't be a bad thing. But the truth is that we are each individually choosing that wrong. It's not a collective guilt, it's individual guilt. Third, we have a subconscious belief that mere time cancels sin. However, God is outside of time, meaning that he experiences our sins in the entirety at once. So a lot of times, I like to think of when I sit in a group with friends and I talk about things that I did in my childhood, um, just 
little scandalous things. We all have those. It's college. We all do those. Um, and so in the future, we're going to look back on these stories and these pranks that we pulled, and we're going to laugh. But God sees these all at the same time. So we're, we expen- experience time linearly. So here's the beginning, here's the end, and we just take it each step of the way. But God sees it all at the same time. And so that means that he sees our sins as they're happening. So those things that I did 10 years ago, he still sees them happening. And for me, I don't know, when I read this book, that really resonated with me because it said that God sees everything I've done all at the same time. He sees my collective guilt for my entire life and he still saw me as worthy of redemption. He still sought me out, out of love. Um, third, we have a subconscious belief. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that. Fourth, we should fight the urge to feel less guilty because of how common sin is. So like what I said with speeding, just everybody does it, so we're all guilty. In addition to these considerations, Lewis also says that we feel norms and pockets of society, that moral law must be sought out before it can be transcended, and that our sin is our responsibility, not God's. Sin is our fault. God, God allowed for the possibility of it out of love, um, just so that we would have the opportunity to truly love him. Love without choice is not love, it's control. So, to address the origin of human wickedness, Lewis proposes a theor- theoretical chronology for the fall of man. Lewis, at this point, is talking about evolution. And he introduces the story where Adam, it, it kind of combines evolution with creationism and how if Adam and Eve aren't the first two people, how could sin have entered the world? And he said that the, basically what he said is that the source of all sin is pride. Um, That the first sin was not out of just rebellion, but it was out of pride that we saw ourselves as better than God. And so he explores that as the main cause of sin. So here we get to the big point. In the climactic center of the book, Lewis explores human pain. Devoting two chapters to the topic, he considers a question that arises in Christian theology. Is pain a necessary part of goodness? He begins by stating that humans are rebellious creatures that continue to hold on to our wills as strongly as possible. Surrendering the will that we desire so much to God is bound to be painful. However, pain can be used for correctional good in our relationship with God. Pain tells us that something is not as it should be, and it heightens our ability to hear God. Pain also reveals retributional characteristics of God. For instance, if an evil man is never made aware of his evil through pain, he will not be inclined to correct it. So God allows pain because of our rebellion. He allows for these consequences because it'll never change if he doesn't. How is someone going to know to correct something if they aren't aware that it's wrong in the first place? And so through allowing for pain, God allows us, through allowing for pain, God gives the opportunity for us to change. So that's, that's kind of the crux of this whole book, is that pain is necessary for us to understand our need for God. In the same way, God uses pain to express his mercy and love by revealing to us our need for him in order to escape our wicked state. He is able to express a sacrificial love to us because the concept of sacrifice is exclusively relevant to a universe that is sinful. It's just a bunch of jargon. Um, <laughs> Lewis then begins to describe our sinful desires how our sinful desires prevent us from knowing if we are truly acting in God's will. The only sure way to know, he says, is to do things that are contrary to our desires. So, what, what, (laughs) this kind of resonates with me today. Um, So, pain and fear and discomfort, God allows also because that's how we know that he's in our will, or in, that we are in his will. So by standing up here and watching half of you fall asleep, I (laughs) am being uncomfortable with that. I am aware that I am doing this for God, that uh, this isn't something that I just truly want to do, but because I'm uncomfortable, I know that this is partially the will of God. So uh, Lewis continues, he just talks about how pain is necessary so that we can fully understand God. I I keep saying the same thing over and over again. But pain was not, pain does not indicate a bad God or an evil God. It was not his choice, but he allowed it because that's when we have the opportunity to choose him. I, I don't know if I'm being clear. It, everyone kind of understanding? Okay, a few head nods. <laughs> that's good. Ten of you understand. 
Um, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> just to kind of wrap up um, a couple more points. He also talks about hell and heaven in his last two chapters. Um, hell, he talks about how we don't really know what it is. Um, it could be just complete annihilation. It could be burning for eternity. Uh, but the point is that it's separate from God and it's separate from other people. And we won't, a lot of people wonder about heaven and how if we're in heaven, won't we feel sympathy for the people in hell? Doesn't that make us, you know, better than God because we feel sympathy for them and he doesn't? But the truth is, what, Ar or what Lewis argues, is that hell and heaven are completely separate, separate realms. Heaven is in the complete presence of God and hell is in the complete absence. So in, the, in these separate realms, we can't, we can no longer conceive of not being in God's presence. So by being fully in his presence, we can't understand not being in his presence, if that makes sense. And so heaven, he, he also continues, talks about how we are all going to realize everything that we couldn't before. We can't possibly understand what heaven is like, and we can't possibly desire it because we're stuck in pain. We are stuck in a suffering world. And in a world where there's evil, we cannot understand or comprehend a world where it's all good. And so that's why we struggle so much to long for Jesus. That's why we have these periods of spiritual highs and spiritual lows. It's because we can't fully understand what's next, and we can't long for something that we can't understand. Um, and so he, the last big point that I want to share with you guys is just the idea that we all experience a piece of heaven. So Lewis argues this idea that each of us is given this very deep desire for heaven. Um, I know for me, mine is just emotion, that God, God has given me such an emotional state, and I can look at things, one of my favorite things are sunsets, and I can look at a sunset, and I just feel the sunset, like, people, people will look at it, and they'll say, oh yeah, it's pretty, whatever, um, but I can really feel that, and that's a good thing, because I'm actually colorblind, and I can't see the whole thing, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but there, we just all have those kind of experiences where, um, where we understand a piece of heaven that nobody else can. And all these people, you can say, look, look at that sunset. Look at how great it is. And they'll say, yeah, that's really pretty. And they can really come to appreciate it. But for me, it means something so much deeper. Sunsets are where I feel God. And we're all given a different desire. Something as cheesy as a sunset probably isn't um, what's for you. But in sports, in athletics, in school, in family, you know, we all have our own way that we experience heaven, and there's something about it that we can just never fully be fulfilled. We, we look at these things, and you just want more. I look at a sunset, and I just, I'm like, ah, I just want more. I just want this to continue, and I, I don't even know what it means, but God, <coughs> excuse me, God gives us each one of these things that we are just longing for that won't be fulfilled until heaven. And so he uses this just to say, look forward to heaven when these things are satisfied. Look forward to Jesus because these are where these longings, these desires that are never fully complete. This is where they'll be complete. And so my, I promise my last point that I want to share with you um, is, is about pain for the atheist versus pain for the Christian. So for those of you that um, believe in or that don't believe in God, I understand that, and Lewis did too. Um, he was an atheist for most of his life, and so he has plenty of books on that. But the reason that pain is such a hard concept for atheists to grasp is because you are born into pain, you live your life in pain, and you die in pain, and that is it. You, the whole world, you, the, your whole life, you just suffer, and there's no end to it. But the reason it's so easy for us as Christians to understand pain and to be okay with it is because there's something more. There's something next. And I just want you guys to keep that in mind that we can't, for those that don't believe in God, I pity you because there's just, there's no end to it. We just live in a crappy world and a crappy place and it's just, there's no hope for it. But for the Christians, there is a hope for it. There's something that comes after, and there's a reason for everything that we deal with. So um, I just want to read these verses for you really quick. 
and then I'll pray, and then you guys will be dismissed. So, in John 16, verses 6, beginning in verse 16, Jesus says, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. At this, some of the disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father? They kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you'll see me no more, and then I, in a little bit you'll see me again? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn into joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy." In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until, na- <coughs> Excuse me. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I have been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. And in that day, you will ask in my name. I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I come from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. So all of this just saying that right now, things are going to suck. Right now, things are terrible. But as we look to the future, as we find our hope in Christ, there is an end, there is a reason, there is a purpose for our pain. And just because there's so much pain in the world doesn't mean that there isn't a good God. It actually does mean that there is a good God. We couldn't conceive of something good if we didn't have evil. So I just want to encourage you guys that your pain has a purpose, and that doesn't make it less difficult to bear, and it doesn't make it less important, but it just it gives you a purpose, and in Christ we have a reason to look forward to something else. So pray with me real quick, and then you guys are dismissed. God, I just thank you so much for today. I thank you for uh, this beautiful weather that you've given us lately and just for this opportunity to come and present. God, I I just pray that the words that have come out of my mouth today were yours and not mine. Um, I know that it is your spirit that filled me and calmed my nerves. And God, I just pray that in the same way you would fill the nerves of everyone in this room, God, that you would just spread like wildfire on this campus and that you would just calm our fears of life, calm our fears our fears of school, of sports, of acceptance, of depression. God, there's just so much that we're dealing with. And even though we know it's out of love that you allow for the possibility of pain, it doesn't make it less, it doesn't make it more enjoyable. So God, I just ask that you would give us your spirit and help us to know that um, you are working through the pain and that you allow it just to draw us back to you. It's in your name I pray. Thank you, guys.